Go. Petty equals five. Okay, to do your best, do your best, like really try to figure it out, okay? How you doing? Good, you on double duty? Oh yeah, Cersei is gone in Alaska. Triple duty, dad Triple. duty, teacher duty, podcast duty. Exactly, surf journalist duty. Quadruple duty. Yep. Um, well, I appreciate you taking the time. Welcome. It is uh, The Grit for March 24th, 2022. What a day. What a, well, I've got all sorts of listener stuff today. Um, it turns out that we have some very talented listeners. We have former world champion surfers. We have some of the world's best surfboard shapers. We have professors at Ivy League schools. But today we found the most talented among all of our listeners. By far. By far. Um, I will explain. He will actually showcase his talents, but he also called in. And um, I don't think you've heard his call yet. So I'm going to play his call for you before we showcase his talent. Great. Hey, what's up, Chaz? David Lee. Uh, this is your boy, Bruce, from Austin, Texas. Hey, uh, as soon as I heard about Chaz's new book, uh, blessed are the bank robbers. Uh, you know, as soon as I heard the name of the book, it, uh, man, something just struck a chord. And, uh, it, you know, there's something I really love about antiheroes. And, uh, 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 just immediately I, uh, I picked up my guitar and, uh, <laughs> 25 minutes later, I wrote a song in tribute to, uh, Chaz's new book called Blessed are the Bank Robbers. And I, I really feel like, uh, Look, there's some good songs out there in the past that have been written about uh, great books. Uh, one one off the top of my head is For Whom the Bell Tolls by Metallica. A fantastic song uh, about, you know, about a fantastic book. So, Chaz, I felt like I needed to do you that honor um, for all the, the work that you guys have been doing. Um, this is just my little tribute to you guys. And uh, I don't know if you catch it, but uh, in the bridge, uh, I shout out a little little thump something to the grit podcast but uh anyway boys i hope you can play it and uh chaz i hope you like it and uh i just want to say to all you folks out there make sure you pick up your copy of lester of the bank robbers available now wherever books are sold especially in your local bookstore uh, all right keep up the work boys cheers what are your thoughts for bruce in austin I mean, it puts a tear in my eye. The, the song is, for one, absolutely an incredible song. It's not like a, I was half thinking it was going to be, you know, a satirical, which I would have also loved, like, uh, but it is like a proper, true song. And the fact that Bruce went to not only the effort to write it, the effort to play it, the effort to record it just makes me weepy. It's what it does, David Lee. <laughs> It's a legit professional recording studio production. Of an awesome song. like Of a, an epic song. And it, exactly the way the song should have been recorded. Like a little bit of Johnny Cash, a little bit of Rockabilly. Yeah. Like a perfect old-timey bank robbing tune. It really is. Um, obviously, we got to play this for the listeners right now, right? In its entirety? For sure. For sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and push play for everybody. Five, nine, one. David 2, Cruiser 29. The hold up alarm is sounding at the Southwest Bank, Kings Highway and Southwest. 10 11. Hit the drawer, no need to hit the floor. It's a lonely 
only take a second if you just do what I say. It's all good, it's fun. I need to use my gun. Then I hit that open road and leave my troubles far behind. Bust all them bank robbers, no good at thieving jobbers, living on the lawless side of life. Bust all them bank robbers, no good at thieving jobbers, put them in the clank one time to think of the next damn bag of cash they're gonna take. Okay, so that was uh, Bruce. I don't know Bruce's last name, but the band name is Island Mind. Um, it is available on Spotify. It is available on iTunes. It is available on YouTube. Just search Blessed Are the Bank Robbers, Island Mind. It's not even for sale. It's just he put it up there for free for all of your listening pleasure. It is so epic, so wonderful. And it also made me go down the Island Mind rabbit hole. And now Island Mind is on my Spotify playlist incredible yep. and i mean yeah obviously bruce has real talent and he knows what he's doing um he does this professionally i in fact met bruce five years ago in austin texas believe it or not oh how does how describe bruce to me um do you want to guess what bruce looks like bruce in my mind is like uh skinny tattooed uh, wears flannel shirts and a um, little bit longer hair uh, and some scruff. Yes, uh, you're definitely down the right path. Um, beard, mustache, black hair, long hair. Yep. I remember he was wearing a hat and sunglasses. Um, but yeah, rock, rock and roller kind of lemmy type vibes. Oh, love it yeah love it but it was real funny um he was spending it was the coors pool in austin doug coors pool i forget what yeah. that one was called the wave it was, garden it was, one it was a wave garden yeah and enland yeah <laughs> and enland wave park i think is what it was called and uh he was uh, obviously he lives in austin and that one's right there so he was going there pretty regularly and then i mentioned I think on a podcast that I was going to go surf it and maybe he messaged me in advance and he's like, Oh, when are you coming? What day are you coming? And I told him. And when we got out of the water with the crew that I was with, we were just walking back to like dry off and get some lunch. And he was sitting there at the bar and he's like, David. And I'm like, yeah, it's like Bruce, dude, I'm Bruce from Austin. I'm like, no way. Oh yeah. So we had a brief chat that was very, very brief, but um, he's emailed every once in a while and I think sent me a couple of music things here and there, but this one was just home run out of the park. I mean, thank you, Bruce. I can't thank you enough, in fact, Bruce. And I actually love the song, so it makes it even better. It's a total joy. Yeah, Island Mind for anybody. Um, and then there was another call that relates to it 
from Alejandro in San Diego. So let me play that for you. Chaz, David, it's uh, Alejandro again. I think it would be really interesting to hear from Chaz. How do you write a book? Like, what is Chaz's process, at least? Like, do you outline the book? Are you compiling compiling just random things that you've pulled together over time and stitching stuff together like it sit in one go? Um, obviously, you don't write a book in one go. But, yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Please elaborate. Thanks, guys. Yeah, bro. You. What's your process for writing a book? Odd, it's so funny. It has changed over the years, uh, or from the first book, Welcome to Paradise, till now. Um, it, I'll tell you, I guess what it, the thing, the thing that has remained the same is I don't outline it at all. Uh, okay. it, in order to sell a book, you need to, uh, for a nonfiction book, the way they sell is they sell on concept, basically, and proposal, not on a finished book. So if you write a non-finished book, you got to write the whole thing and then turn it into the editor or turn it into the agent who then flips it to publishers and long process, right? Because everybody's got to read the whole thing. Uh, nonfiction, you all the way the uh, kickoff goes is I'll think of an idea, write like a one page proposal to agent. Uh, she'll, if she likes it and says, yes, this is something, this is, you know, has some legs. Then I'll write like a 20 page ish proposal which has like a longer kind of, uh, I don't know, synopsis of what it's gonna be, plus chapter outline, plus blah, 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 blah. Kick it to her, she jimmies with it, and then off to the publisher, then whatever, it's either accepted or not. Uh, so that's the only time I ever outline it, and I never look at it again, that. Like, hmm. I'll try not to veer too wildly off what I propose, but when I sit down to start to write, uh, I'll just start, sentence one chapter one and write from there, from there and I don't know if it's the it's probably not the smartest way um because you get uh lost in your damn it there. I can still hear you yeah I okay. can hear you you get lost in or I will get lost down a rabbit hole like the book will have started as one thing in my mind and then turn into another uh as I'm writing it and then, so then I have to go back to the start and readjust and all that. But I, that's my process is I just start at the start and continue to go and then go change the start to reflect uh, the middle and the end as the idea evolves. Um, this next one though, I wanna be a lot more rigid. The next plan at least is to do a book on ballet. And I wanna be a lot more rigid in both the interviews and the history. And so I'll probably go compile do like bunches of research and interviews before I even start writing, but then I'll start at the beginning and cruise through. What if as you're writing, let's say, as you explain, like in chronological order, starting at the beginning and working your way through, an idea might pop up for something in the end. Maybe it's an anecdote or just a, uh, you know, a scenario, a funny scenario that you want to use. Do you at least scribble that down? Typically, yeah, I'll have like a kind of notes uh, as I'm writing, um, but they're usually not very, very, yeah, usually actually they're on my phone. I'll have some idea and I'll punch into my phone like, ooh, end this way or do this later, but I'll just come back. I won't write it then. I'll re kind of, if I remember to look at my phone, well, yeah. remember what I wrote and like, okay, that was a good one or that wasn't, that, that was a dumb idea. That's what I was going to say. The notes app on my phone is meant, I do it for organizational purposes, but lose things in there all the time. My notes app is so like when I scroll through, sometimes I will make myself chuckle by the ideas that I thought either were genius at the time that I had totally. to write down or things that were actually pretty good that I totally forgot that I, that I was thinking about and thinking, yeah. Well, so, um, to Alejandro's point, though, in Blessed Are the Bank Robbers, it isn't all told from beginning to end. There are portions that it'll cut away for a chapter and be like, here's a brief history on bank robbing. So is that the editor's direction? No, that's just the way. That's just my like natural storytelling, I suppose, is uh, coming in and out of a narrative, but 
it's I always have to have a like main driving narrative in my, in my mind. There's no, it's hard for me to do it different than that to do like, so the, in Blessed Are the Bank Robbers, the, my cousin Danny, the bank robber, it's me and his story is, and his story is one narrative through line where I splice in different histories of this, that, or the other thing as I'm, as I'm going along. Do you write that all in the way that it's laid out in the book or do you add that in afterwards? No, I, I write it as it's laid out in the book. Wow. I'll like we get to the end of a, a narrative section and then think, okay, hey, this is the time now to dip back Funny. into a historical section. Funny. And then we talked about it uh, at Warwick's, but uh, what is your actual day-to-day -day process? Like, do you wake up, get a cup of coffee and start writing or where does writing fit into your day? I mean, that's funny has changed, I guess, the most. Uh, I used to have, I used to write in the morning and throughout the day, kind of. Uh, Welcome to Paradise, I think I would just post up and write all day. Um, and then also would uh, take like a extended weekend, three or four days, leave and go away somewhere and really work hard on it. I did that for cocaine and surfing too. And also I think for, uh, reports from hell this one I didn't not only did I not go away to write uh it's I just I had to fit it around my schedule of parenting and teaching and podcasting and beach gritting and all of it uh, so for this one I would write typically at night or uh weekends kind of day where I had a I had a you know hour chunk here or there a lot of it was actually written when daughter was at ballet is the writing better or worse than uh, when you go away for the weekend and just do it all at once? I think better. Uh, I mean, writing for me is just fits in any, like I'm always jamming it in. I'm always writing in short bursts and so I can do it. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's hard to say. This next one, I do want to take more time. I want to actually go away uh, and give it some more real thought. Uh, I think that the way my writing maybe has improved is by the more I do it. I remember the first magazine article I wrote, I thought I was a stinking genius. Uh, and it came back it was for Australia's surfing life and it came back and it was so bad that I vowed to never write again. I thought, Oh, I mean, it was literally so bad that I just thought, Oh, great. I thought that I had, could be a writer. Maybe I thought that it was something that I might like to do. And I see how terrible this is. Uh, that it is something I will never be able to do. So great, no problem. And then wrote again a year later for basically, I think it was a year later for Vice, or maybe it was six months later, whatever. And that piece I kind of liked. And the more I wrote, the more I, it's like hearing your own voice, right? The first time you hear your own voice, it is so jarring. The second time you hear it, it's pretty jarring. The third time you hear it, it's not as jarring. And eventually your voice, recorded voice, matches the voice in your head. Like, that's the way I feel about when I hear myself on a podcast now, I used to cringe so bad. Now I'm just like, oh, that's me. You know, maybe I'm saying stupid yeah. stuff, but that's my voice. I feel that's the way it's been with writing and also with books. So I'm hoping that each book gets better in the fact in reflecting more accurately uh, the truth of, of what I'm trying to say. It's so funny the way that that works. And you're right. It does exist in a lot of different areas that, um, learning curve of when you're starting out, you're really trying to be something. You're trying to yeah. execute a vision. You're trying to do something. And there's nothing worse than that. That exactly. And it's cringy. Like the, the viewer, the reader, the listener, whatever, can identify that instantly. And But you may still have talent at that thing, but there is a learning curve of being able to shake that off, let the talent do its thing. And then at some point in that learning curve, there is a um, not feeling insecure about the voice, not feeling just kind of letting it do its thing and getting out of the way, not feeling insecure about the feedback that comes with it. And once you can really settle into the thing and just do it naturally, like you said, be comfortable with your own voice figuratively or literally on the podcast. Um that's a unique spot. And then you can kind of start stretching out a little bit and fulfill the space that you already kind of occupy because you did all the work to get there, but really settle into it and fill it out, you know? Could not have said it better. Like that's exactly what it is. And I feel at this point in my career, 
I have sort of arrived at the creating the space. I'm still very annoyed with like, I feel like getting the way way too much and letting the thing breathe. I mean, that's why I'm always looking forward to the next one because I just think I can do better. I can do better. They come out and I'm never putting something out that I think I did bad, uh, but they come out, right? And I think I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. And yeah, like I think Blessed are the Bank Robbers is probably my best work yet. And, but I'm excited to do better. Right. Well, it's funny, not to make this about me, but um, I've done literally thousands of podcasts at this point between the various shows and on Surf Splendor, 405 episodes, I think we're at, you know, of these hour to 90 minute long interviews. So I think that qualifies as a certain level of adequacy and um, expertise, but still almost every time before an interview, I'll be downstairs with Lauren and just I'll have anxiety and I'll even tell her, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't like, I feel anxious about it. I'm not sure that I'm fully prepared. And I go upstairs and I do it and I come back down and she goes, how did it go? I'm like, A plus. It was so good. It was really entertaining. I had a blast doing it. Um, I'm really thrilled I got to talk to that person. We had such good rapport. You know, I think it's going to be a great episode. She's like, why do you get worked up every time before you do it? And it's like, I don't know. It's seven, eight years in and I still feel it for some reason. It, it is totally true. Like it's a feeling that I, I suppose never goes away. And I suppose if it goes away, if you're not, then you're, then you're being lazy, right? I would, I would imagine. Like if you're just mailing it oh, in, thinking, okay, I got this, you know, whatever, cool, it's cool. Like, I don't have to try it this anymore. Then that would come across to the reader or the listener or the viewer of Maybe. somebody who, somebody who's not like, I think to be completely engaged in an art, you have to be outside of yourself and it has to make you nervous. Are you watching that Andy Warhol documentary on Netflix? No, I will be tonight, though. That sounds great. It's based on the diaries, the Andy Warhol diaries. They made an actual documentary series, like eight, I think eight one hour long episodes uh, that are just literally based on the diary entries. So they can't read them all because that book's giant, but they do select a portion of them that they have video footage and all this other archival stuff to build around the diary entry. And then they get an AI voice to, to read do the diary. So it sounds like Andy's reading his own diary uh -oh. and uh, it's really, really good. I mean, is it like, yeah, I mean, talk about thinking creative process. It's really, really good from all of those angles because he was very much not accepted by the mainstream art community. And they, they have video footage of art critics, the best art critics at the time, just fully writing him off, you know, just like this guy's a hack and it's all superficial based on pop culture or whatever. And all of pop culture and even the uh, art market was supporting him. But the critics were the ones who just could not wrap their heads around it. And so, but to hear, because it's uh, told through his diaries, you hear all of his insecurity every step of the way, which he maintained throughout, throughout all of it. Yeah. I mean, I think the greatest, the greatest artists always are wacky, right? Like Dostoevsky and the, I mean, all of them, they're messed up. And yeah. I don't know that I'm messed up and maybe I should be more messed up and I'd make you a better artist, but it's a funny thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's the uh, insecurity is what's appealing to the viewer, I think, and relatable if the insecurity is um, I, like, I don't know how to word it, but like there's some people whose insecurity is so that they're trying so hard to mask it that then it's cringy. But if yep. the insecurity plays as vulnerability is when it's very relatable and you want to actually be supportive of it, you know? Totally. Um, well, at any rate, this is another listener thing that came through that I wanted to share with you because you'll appreciate the handwrittenness of it, the effort that went into it. Beautiful. Uh, and it's somebody that you know. This comes from Channel Bottom. Oh, Channel Bottom, a handwritten letter from Channel Bottom. A Channel Bottom handwritten letter shipped all the way from New South Wales, Australia. And he shipped this to us like a month ago. In he the asked post. for my app. Yeah, in the post mail and um, asked for my address. I gave it to him. Nothing showed up. And then he messaged me back and goes, dude, 
it got returned after a couple of weeks, it got returned because whatever, it did something wrong or the customs form wasn't filled out correctly. So then he reshipped it. So he had to pay shipping twice on it. Um, but he says, dear David and Charles, please accept these patently stupid, stupid stickers and consider yourselves quote on the team. I'll go on to read the rest of it, but I just want to give you an idea of the stickers. It's all centered around the idea of Hurley selling out and becoming like Lululemon. So the brand is Herluli. And it's got like an, a, an, a, um, a kind of a combination of the Lululemon logo with the Hurley logo, which are very similar. I never noticed how similar those two logos were, but Herluli, one of my favorite stickers that he created was Andy Irons. And it's Andy Irons ironing a shirt. <laughs> So Andy literally irons and it's him. Andy irons. Yes, it's him in that classic stance. I think that was shot at Chopu maybe um, standing there, but it's an ironing board that's in front of him and he's ironing a shirt. It's laundry and dry cleaning and minor altercations. Love it. And then there's don't follow your nightmares with a dream catcher. Another oh, classic. So good. There's the world surf legume. Oh, I like the World Surf League. Yeah. yeah, with a modification on the World Surf League logo. Anyways, the letter goes on to say, this exclusive membership allows you to get 30% off all Herluli products in all leading surf shops, free dry cleaning, and of course, free access to the WSL website facilities. Enjoy. Derek Riley did not want to give me his address to send him some. I can't blame him. So please feel free to distribute these as you see fit sustainably sloppy shakas channel bottom p.s barrel or not sending free stickers to media figures who are undoubtedly wealthier than oneself i mean barrel but he should he should have charged we should we should throw five dollars five u.s dollars in the mail back to channel bottom i'll find him on venmo or something i'll i'll cover his costs perfect uh so yeah, I've got these batch of stickers. We need to figure out how to distribute these. Oh, that's a great, that's going to be something we're going to have to think on. Yeah, that's fine with me. We can give them to uh, people who have called into the listener line over the last few months or something like that. Wow. I have all of those numbers because the call log saves them. So maybe I could just shoot them a text message or something. Um, but thanks and shout out to Channel Bottom, long time Beach Grit uh, contributor, right? Great. I mean, makes me laugh regularly in the comment section. And now I get to laugh IRL. Exactly. Uh, all right. So this one comes via email. He says, hey, Dave and Chaz, that Aussie chick that called had a question about transgender people. This is my question. We know that men cross over to women's sports often, or not often, but um, we'll just leave it at there. Men cross over to women's sports, period. How often do women cross over to men's sports? This transgender thing in sports seems kind of lopsided. It seems that men being subpar at their sport and then transitioning are getting a new lease on life in the sporting arena, competing against women. To my point, how often does a woman go to the same, go through the same route, i.e. changing sex in order to be able to compete with or against males? Keep up the work. You know, I can't say that I've ever, or yeah, don't know of an incident. Do you? I mean, I was trying Not to think. Of, I was trying to think of a sport where uh, essentially women are way better than men. So you think ice skating? I mean, but they're all different, right? Like the men do different things in ice skating. So like, if a woman went and ice skated against men, transitioned. I mean, became a male to ice skate against the men then she would be theoretically way more graceful or whatever, but couldn't do the high jumps, right? So yeah, like, I mean, what what is a sport where women just crush the men? Well, I don't think there is, uh, it'd be, I'd be hard pressed to find a sport because I think sporting was always based on kind of the male uh, physique and athletic prowess, right? Like stronger, faster, that sort of thing. But I think that there are lots of examples outside of sport, um, maybe not lots of examples, but certain industries where women earn more than men and are more valued than men. And what so, about, 
I got one. Okay. Keep finish that thought, but I have. One. Well, I was like, I was thinking like, um, you know, I, I would imagine that women uh, runway models make more than male runway models. And you could probably see a female runway model transition into a male and actually become the darling of the male runway world. I yes. would think. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, my example, I just realized was, again, man transitioning to woman. Uh, but if you watch Euphoria, the HBO show, Hunter, uh, yeah. I can't remember her last name, but uh, is model. But again, that's male to female. So, And I was thinking about that too, even in like uh, certain levels of entertainment, like drag queens, it's male transitioning to female and their celebrity. And, you know, I think that there are some examples of in entertainment, like um, Pat, Pat was non-binary though. You know, yeah. Pat, what, Pat wasn't identifying as male. Um, Isn't that funny? There was a whole joke on a non-binary person. I think the comedian who played Pat has spoken to it being insensitive if i'm not incorrect uh but i mean in our like normal lifetime when we were teenagers a running joke on saturday night live was about a non-binary person well there's a great show on showtime a 30-minute comedy that's exactly about that the lead character is uh i don't know if she's actually non-binary but Pat is a guest on her show because that whole conversation is part of the theme. And then she ends up in like episode one or two, uh, a, seeing Pat in public and then addressing Pat and addressing the problem. And then Pat becomes a friend. And that's like a recurring conversation that's going on throughout the series. Interesting. It's really good. Um, we got like one full season through and then a little bit into season two and kind of fell off it, but we still really like it. Uh, but the name of the show is so vague or um, ge generic that I can never remember the name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, and so is life or something yeah. like that. That you're just like, how am I ever going to remember that? Uh, but I'll try to find it and send it to you because it is really interesting. Yeah. But to, to our listeners email, it does present an interesting point. I think De Derek wrote a story, uh, I think it was a, I can't remember. It was in the New York Times, I believe, about, man, I'm going to blow the whole thing. Can't remember if it was a social scientist or who the author was, but it was about women's sport. And uh, I think part of her line was that we're looking at sport all wrong. We're looking at sport through this male, exactly like you described, right? This feat of strength or whatever kind of thing, where we're all looking through it through a male lens to begin with, which is yeah. possibly the wrong way to look at it. So it's hard though, it's hard to change the way you look at something. I totally understand and will give grace to, oh, there is a whole different side. There's not just one way to look at stuff, right? Uh, with the sporting whole conversation, it's difficult uh, for me to, to wrench my brain another way. Not that I shouldn't be able to, and I would like to be able to, but it's hard. Well, my buddy Sean emailed about this a couple of weeks ago, when the com I guess nine days ago, when the conversation first came up. And he said, this is how I like to process things. What is real and what is essential? On sports, sport adds tremendous value to humanity, but sports aren't real. Sports are games. Games aren't real. Games shouldn't influence or hold power over anything or anyone. Transgender people are real. If you're going to accept them, we have to accept them in full faith and full standing. It's a human issue and human issues are messy. People can play these games within the roles they identify. Some will shine, some will fail. The game itself doesn't change. Will it be unfair to the other athletes? There will be perceived unfairness based on outmoded expectations for the limited period of time. These temporary unfairness within the construct of the game, a silly game, by the way, is a worthwhile trade-off when helping a maligned segment of, a human of humanity gain acceptance in society. Profound, except I would counter with uh, more often than not, the people who have to bear the brunt of uh, this realignment are women right? It's not men who are getting their records. And 
however silly sport may be or however silly a job may be or whatever, right? Working. I mean, all of these things, like it's women who are nine times out of 10 on the short end of the stick and are once again on the short end of the stick when it comes to trans rights. Like, and again, the modeling example is great. Like male models are total second class citizens compared to female models. And it would be like if a bunch of, you know, didn't quite make it female models transitioned to male and then took all the jobs where there was no, you know, and it's hard to cry about over male models, but it'd be the same diff like where, okay, we just wiped out your industry more or less. I mean, it's an incredible like, concept. If there was a female model who was struggling to make it, you know, like she's barely getting work, low paid, all that, but has an epiphany or maybe they're legitimately trans. It shouldn't even be like a game that she's trying to play, but she's legitimately trans and she transitions into male uh, and then takes over that world. It'd be incredible. Yeah. It's a story. Nobody would cry for the male model either. Definitely so, not. Tears no. of a male model. Ooh, that's another song for Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing I do like my buddy Sean's email and that does uh, allow us to kind of re focus our, or reshift our worldview or just shift our worldview. But I don't necessarily believe that games aren't real. Like sport is some of the most primary thing about being human. There's two people running. I mean, originally they're running from a lion, right? And you want to know which guy can run faster because it matters because that lion's going to eat the other person. And so you just think, huh, let's just see who's the faster runner. But it's unfair to have a seven foot guy running against a five foot guy. So we need to create some sort of categories and generalizations. And the, the categories that formed very kind of organically were gender separation, you know? And so sporting and wanting to compare people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, aptitude is just so innate in human beings. I think that is real. And it's compelling and it's billion and billion of dollar, dollar, dollar industries in a lot of different ways. And so there is value there and interest there. But I do agree with what he's saying is like, these people are also real and the humanity that they need to feel is also real. So I think there's going to be a time in the near future, probably where there is a category for trans people to compete in against similarly abled and developed trans people, you know, six foot people against six foot people or whatever it is. Um, and then things would be a lot more interesting because the competition, once you have that male transitioned to female swimmer who is ranked 400th in the males division, now smashing all the women's records because his body is just built so much more efficiently for swimming or her body is built so much more efficiently for swimming the competition is now not that interesting. You know, yeah. it nullifies the original intent, which was to see who can beat each other by these nanoseconds. I hear you. Surfing, so, surfing, so. Long, professional longboarding is where all of this will come together. Professional longboarding Completely. will be a great equalizer where you could have men competing against women. You don't need to have it's the one place in the whole world. You don't need to have a break between the sexes truly the one place and how i mean the wsl's biggest missed opportunity of everything that we've ever talked about was when joel tudor starts spouting about equality for them just to jump on that and be like here we go full know, open division i do not know how that opportunity was not seized upon where you don't sell it even to hbo as like a true battle of the sexes except instead of billy jean king versus uh Oh, who was the guy? I should know him. He has a tennis club right up the street. Um, whatever his name is. Uh, that, yeah. uh, instead of just a one, you would have a whole thing. You would have daily, or not daily, but every event would be this battle of the sexes. Who's going to win, women or men? Would have been beautiful. I mean, this is unbelievable. Like that was the opportunity of a lifetime for the WSL. non surfers would have watched when their current world champ calls them out publicly, if they pivoted instantly and turned to HBO, turned to ESPN and just said, we're getting called out and we are going to do something about it. Our claims of equality are not just uh, 
whatever, you know, virtue signaling. They are legit. And now we're going to do a full open division and he's going to have to compete against everybody else. Of all gender. Gender. Wonderful. 50 year old Joel, Joel Tudor would have had, to, I mean, and the fact that the, the girl just won the Noosa, I know. you know, which it was like a legit serious. I mean, it's not like a serious as in crazy WSL, but like a fully legit contest that's well-respected ancient like well attended yeah. etc yeah no one just one so throw them out there together come on Devin howard totally awesome. well the crazy the crazy thing is we were pitching this idea well over a year ago i mean we were pioneers of equality david lee scales <laughs> but it's not like they had now we're offering it in hindsight i mean the timing we're identifying in hindsight but we were pitching this quite a long time ago forever ago i just i do not know how it doesn't make perfect sense where we, it's like oh like, I mean, even talking about now, like working through like swimming and sport, and da, 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 there is, there actually is one where it's equal. And we were actually pitching this to Devin himself on air. He came onto the podcast at album and we told him this and he was, he, he thought it was a good idea. He just seemed like he was in unable to enact it. Yeah. He had a stand stand. Do the right thing. World circling. Yeah. Um, another listener line call. We were talking last week about being blocked by Kelly Slater. And then somebody called in and was like, dude, I've been blocked by staff. I haven't seen their post in a long time. I looked them up and turns out I was blocked by them for presumably he's like, from what I can identify, I was calling out Ashton, just talking about how try hard he is in all of his um, video pieces that he does. So here's another call. David, Chaz, I got one better about the uh, being blocked nonsense. But check this out. Ashton Goggins blocked me via stab on my personal account. I can't see stab anymore. It's probably because I used to bitch and complain about why are you making us pay for this stuff? Let us see it for free. Anyway, block me. But at the same time, Ashton Goggins' personal account follows me. What the hell? Block me, then keep tabs on me? Come on. Classic, uh, classic slap and tickle right there. <laughs> what is the old slap and tickle i know the phrase but what is that <laughs> even from i don't know i think it's just you continue to uh keep somebody like off balance by oh, okay. using them and loving them up got it got it yeah. got it that is that is um, confusing though that is confusing to be blocked and continue to be followed well he's uh, that listener by the way that listener he called back to identify himself rouser works is his instagram handle and uh he won one of our surfboard giveaways oh great congrats yes. Rouser works yeah so he called back was like oh by the way um I'm a winner. This, yeah this i should identify myself but the funny thing is he's um presuming that it was ashton's finger that blocked him via the stab account i suppose that is a presumption he doesn't know that I suppose. I mean, I think he's basing the assumption on the fact that Ashton then shortly after followed him on the personal account. So he's probably just putting two and two together, but you know, but it is weird for Stab to even be blocking anybody. I mean, my goodness gracious me, like unless somebody is like a violent sexual predator on social media or like wishing death, yeah. I, don't, I don't have any idea what would create, we talked about this last time, like companies, corporations getting their feelings hurt is absolutely bizarre. You don't have feelings. I know that the United States of America has ruled that corporations are people, but I as a person still think that's dumb and corporations don't get feelings. Like you can block somebody for being violent or for being perverse, or there's reasons to block somebody. There is no reason to block somebody for hurting your feelings. Yeah, I mean, it's just not in the company's best interest. So it's the company should always be thinking about how to increase the bottom line and move the ball forward. And I, having feelings doesn't service those goals. I having want, feelings services your goals for your personal relationships in your life, not for your business. And the stinking blocking doesn't solve the problem, right? If there is a real problem uh, that your fan base or your readership is revolting against, Blocking people who call that out doesn't solve the problem, right? Like exactly. Yeah. If you really believe in your strategy, if you pivot somewhere and people are frustrated about it, 
understandable. They're go there's always going to be frustrated people. Let them air their grievance. If they're right and you did a bad pivot, then more people will jump on, right? And you'll have to rechange, but that'll be good. You'll, you need it to rechange. You, you pivoted wrong. If you just block people and block out the noise, they know we're right. You could lose everybody. Yep, completely. 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 That listener feedback, by the way, or in their case, reader feedback is gold. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you need to be able to parse it and take things with a grain of salt, but it is gold. It's it how may, you know how to operate your business. And it may be wrong. Like, right. If he, if he was mad about stab going behind the paywall, he doesn't see the business, let's say, doesn't see the business side of it or whatever. Right. And they may be very legitimately correct in why they did what they did. Uh, you still got to listen to the opinion and just say, you know, either trust us, we've got a bigger plan here, or, you know, agree to disagree. We have a business to run and this is the, we've looked at our whatever's, our projections, and this is the only way to do it, right? But well, still, that feedback is gold. What I find is that the feedback, even if it's uh, kind of wrong headed, there's a morsel in there that has value. And so yes. Rouser works saying, quit putting things behind a paywall. I understand he doesn't understand the business needs to survive and the business will only survive this way. But he's what he's really saying is he wants content that he can view for free. So now I can grow the business in two separate ways. I can build out free content to appeal to him and private content, premium content to appeal to our subscribers, he's always going to complain that he can't see this stuff over here, but he's still going to look at the free stuff. And eventually we'll convert a certain percentage over to premium customers, you know, but to block it is going to block that type of insight from your, your audience. Don't get it. I don't get a company with feelings. Well, we have another call from our favorite caller of all time. Do you know who that would be? Of course, Hannah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Hannah again, your favorite person in the world. So my question for this one, well, it's not really a question, it's more of a statement. I think there should only be 12 men in the WSL because it's fucking boring watching the rest of them and eight women because it's also boring watching the rest of them and it's a waste of time it's a waste of money and i also think that in every competition there should be an indigenous wild card chucked in there barrel or no love you bye bon voyage <laughs> I think, so. I, I think that Hannah should be the uh, commissioner. I mean, Jesse Miley Dyer, you, you've done your work. It's time to move on and let Hannah take over. 12 men, <laughs> 8 women, plus 2 indigenous wild cards. I can sign on to that tomorrow. <laughs> Has Hannah not been listening for the last 8 years of us saying that they need to have exactly that? It, I'm sure she has not, which is perfect, because that is, I feel, again, listening to the feedback, hearing the gold. WSL should be listening to that, too. That's what people want. They don't want stinking 30-odd weird. They want 12 to 16, Max, plus one indigenous yeah. wild card. Um, what the way that I can always easily sum it up, this applies to every event that's happened, I'm going to say, in the last five years. Oh, yeah. They run two full days of competition. Now, a swell generally lasts about three days. So they're using essentially an entire swell to run two full days of competition to eliminate four surfers on the men's side. And in the last five years, not one of those four surfers in any of the events ever had a chance of winning the event and definitely not of a world title. So what the hell are you doing? You know what I mean? Like literally none of those guys ever would have competed for a title. None of them even would have won an event, ever had a chance. And so what are we doing? I mean, the beauty will be, I suppose, is if and when the World Surf League crumbles into a heap 
that what will come out of the ashes will no doubt be a version of that, a version of natural selection, right? Uh, the wife in Alaska right now for stop three, uh, those things finish in two days. It is two days of competition. Uh, they are banger days. They are, it's exciting and you don't, you don't load it on with fat, right? There is hopefully going to be a natural selection of a surf at some point. Yeah. Imagine with television, if it's like, I really want to watch that Andy Warhol series. Okay, cool. Sign on to Netflix, but we're going to make you watch 18 hours of dog crap just to get to the one thing that you want to see. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. an insane notion. It doesn't apply. Or dinner. You're going to have an eight course meal. The eighth course is going to be exactly what you want, but you have to eat dog crap for seven <laughs> courses. The, it's so, the weird thing about it too, to me, is that they've been flogging this thing for years and decades and it hasn't worked right like and they're losing money on it and two yeah. running two days of competition turns out is very expensive still years decades and they don't ever think you know what guys let's actually rethink this whole model instead i think they perpetually think there is a way to make this giant field profitable and all we got to do is figure out how we got to convince people that it's the right thing. You know, let's set up our studios. Let's set up this. Okay. But, oh, dad, dang it. I apparently didn't having the ultimate surfer on ABC apparently did not convert one person over to watching professional surfing. So right. let's try to, what else can we do? Well, let's fire all them. Let's back to the drawing board, but back to the drawing board. Never, never is let's cut this damn thing down to a one swell. Right. So, but in those seven courses before the eighth, it's going to save us money, right? Yeah. No, it's going to cost us more money to have those seven courses. Oh, wait, but it um, provides me sus sustenance and nutrition, right? Nope. nope. Turns out full empty calories. <laughs> well, they're entertaining <laughs> courses, right? No, they turns out they'll bore you so bad. You <laughs> usually don't even make it to the sustainable or to the sustenance course. That's actually good for you what are we doing we're complete it's a waste of everything it's crazy though decades decades of doing this decades decades of losing the money too yeah it's never once the world Surf you know, league has never once been pro or and asp before it. i don't think you've ever once been profitable maybe there was some years in the asp they were probably profitable now that i think about it when billabong rip curl quicksilver volcom whoever were each paying huge amounts of money for those events the world surf league was making a small bit of money i think there was individual events that turned a profit i don't know if the full business turned a profit i think the asp did uh i don't i don't know that billabong etc cetera, etc cetera, they never recouped on that expense right it was a marketing expense for them back when the quicksilver snapper pro a marketing expense for quicksilver they're not trying to recoup the money out of the event the ASP would get, that's why the ASP back then under Brody Carr and Rabbit and all these guys was, uh, it was a tidy little business, right? They were making salaries. They employed a handful of employees. Uh, the brands themselves ran all the production, right? Remember it would be, there was no WSL team. The brands themselves would run both the uh, video production and have their own announcers, right? So all of those events, had different announcers and, you know, some would cross over and do other events and blah, 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 but it was all on the brand. It was marketing. Uh, ASP probably, you know, made whatever. WSL taking it over. I mean, what was Ziff thinking to like, really, if we can go back, what was he thinking to look at that and think without, because he bought it when the brands had already tanked and weren't spending the money anymore, didn't have the money to spend, you know, a million. I remember hearing how much Globe spent for the Fiji event back in the day uh the cloud break one it was so much crazy money it was insane amounts of money that the brands were spending on the events uh i feel I like know. was it three million bucks something like that yeah i think it was well, three million bucks an event yes and for ziff to think okay this is what events cost 
you know, between two and $3 million. That's going to stay. Uh, we're losing all the money from the brands. They can't pay anymore because they're bankrupt. Uh, but we're going to figure out how to crush this money wise by centralizing everything, by spending more money on having, you know, the same commentary team, having a team of video or, you know, the production team, all of that. We're going to pay for all that on top of everything. And we're going to make so much money because what, how, what, what, what did you think was going to come? The business model um, was back in that day was that the brands for that $3 million, they would also get the rights to all that uh, video sure. footage, all of the imagery that came from the event. So then they could use it in their marketing materials. When the WSL took over, they pulled that licensing away. They said, we're going to yeah. own, own this because what they wanted to do was then turn to a network and sell it to them so that the events would then stream on maybe ABC or ESPN or whatever it might be. What so that was the business plan. What Dirk or maybe the management didn't realize was the brands said, well, why are we going to give you $3 million if we're not getting the footage? And then they were also collapsing behind the scenes. So they didn't even have the $3 million to spend anymore from a marketing standpoint. And they weren't willing to do it, even if they had the money, because they weren't getting what they were getting previously. And they weren't able to put their own comment, commentators in the booth and all that other stuff that came with it. The other chip that fell for the WSL was they were never able to put together the licensing deals with the broadcast. So they lost the sponsor dollars and then they never were able to get the money replaced over here. So then they were just left paying out of pocket to run the events and I not mean, sell them. The idea of looking at an internet where entertainment is essentially cheap or free and thinking the gold and them are surfing hills is somebody's going to pay us a lot of money for this content. Even though the entire internet, more or less, internet 1.0 or whatever our internet is, 2.0? Are we in web 2.0? Who knows? Whatever. I have no idea. This web 2.0 idea is, you know, cheap to free entertainment. Yes, over the years, Netflix has raised its subscription, you know, price. And, you know, the streaming services now are charging... I suppose real dollars uh, for that, but still for you know Netflix, what is it now? It's twenty bucks it's, a month. I don't think so. I think it's like thirteen 15. or fourteen bucks. It's fifth. They just they just raised it to fifteen uh, for like not HD or not like ultra four K or whatever it is. I think it's twenty for that. Still for that fifteen to twenty dollars a month, you have a library of film and original production that's wildly huge uh and and continually getting better and continually yeah. adding to it so they're just taking your money and investing it to make it better because they know content creation and they've actually improved storytelling as a whole the films are better tv's better than it's ever been all that wsl has made a worse product than it used to be <laughs> so really funny I mean, they truly, we've been commenting on this all along, but it's kind of funny now to recap it with a little bit of hindsight because they've made the missteps from the bringing, from the revenue standpoint that we already discussed, but then to realize they hired people who didn't understand the product itself, started pivoting away from the product and then to make another crappy product, but then the core product itself also eroded all that was good of it. Like I've kind of continually said, big waves, waves of consequence are compelling. Just put man versus nature, woman versus nature, and that'll solve a lot of problems. They pivoted away from it. They're like, no, we're going to run in beach breaks. We're going to run in wave pools. Actually, the wave pools is such a good idea. We're going to buy it and then try to license out the wave pool. That's what we're going to do. And it's like, what? What? No. Eight foot cloud break. Eight foot pipe. That's all that you need, and everything else solves itself. It's it's truly is. I mean, I would, you know, what we should do. Speaking of Netflix, HBO, we should just write the straight up comedy, The Office slash uh, Office Space slash whatever version of professional surfing. That would be funny and compelling. A straight up satirical comedy of like them really trying to make surfing saleable. Sterling Spencer is putting out episodes daily. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind of, not exactly what you're talking about, but kind of, you know, he's, it's definitely Forward. a send up of pro surfing. Yep. Love it. Uh, all right. Well, I've got a less uh, meaty call, but one that we could certainly answer a question for, for this guy. Chaz, David, uh, this is James from San Diego. Um, I've just been, I'm sure like you guys been uh, scrolling through Instagram and have seen a lot of clips being released of the old Mason Ho at some pretty crazy waves in some cold waters. Um, just curious if either of you have any insider info on where uh, Mason might be surfing. I know that the clip's supposed to drop April 1st, but you know, they say April 1st, and it has me thinking it might be an April Fool's joke. Anyways, uh, wondering if you have any insider uh, information on this. Highly anticipated on my end. Wondering if you guys feel the same. Do you have any idea what he's talking about? Have you been seeing these Mason Ho clips? I sure have been, and it's funny. I haven't thought, I mean, I thought, wow, like, that's crazy, but I haven't thought, where is that yet? Because it's nowhere I'd want to surf, right? Like, usually when I think, where is this? It's like, oh, I see a wave that's so stinking dreamy that, oh, man, I saw one the other day in Scotland. It was like a, I think I just saw it on a weird YouTube ad. Uh, that was like the most playful slab in Scotland. It looked like a total chip in. You do like literally anybody could looks like could get in and then it just barrels around you and then you pop out. That's where I wonder, okay, where is that? That's the kind of wave, the waves that I want to surf. I do not want to surf anything Mason is surfing. And so I haven't thought about it, but for this listener, I will get an answer. I'll figure out where it is. It's Scotland. Is that where he is? A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, nobody told me, but just from looking at the clips, it's totally Scotland. It is. Yeah. He's going to all the same spots that we've seen other people, uh, surf when they do Scotland trips. Well, good. This is like bang for the buck for this listener right here. Yeah. Got yeah. Question answered I, immediately. Yeah. I figured if we have the info, I wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't have played the call probably other than I just wanted to answer his question for him. Right. Um, but yeah, the Mason Ho surfing that slab that it's like right in front of a shelf reef. Yes. On a bigger day, obviously it breaks further out, but he was surfing like a kind of smaller day. So it's right up against that shelf and it's a grower, you know, it like breaks over like one foot on the takeoff. Then it kind of grows into like a head high, big wide barrel. And um, uh, I think Albie Layer and Shane Dorian surfed that in Taylor Steele's, whatever that last, one of his last films that he made was called. And then it showed, and then Mason surfing that long point break that shows all the farmland in the background that they used to do oh, yeah, real right. cold water classic events at. So yeah, Scottish, which is one of, uh, speaking of beach grit, Chaz Michael Michaels home ground, right? JP Kirk Curry, such a great Scotsman. Yeah. One of our favorite Scottish surfers. So Mason Ho's medieval madness is what he's calling it. Um, I presume this is all just an advertisement for Rip Curl to sell the flash bomb wetsuit, but uh, I'm down for it. I mean, good I good yeah, market. good advertising, and like we see plenty of Mason in Hawaii. So yeah, send him somewhere else, and I'm interested. I'll watch it. It's funny the uh, when Rip Curl signed Mason, I thought it was odd, an odd pairing because Mason, in my mind, is so tropical, so Hawaii, and Rip Curl is, of course, Torquay. It's wetsuits, right? Uh, that pairing has, has gone so well, I think. Both Mason's willingness to go to cold water places, and yeah, I say bravo to both Mason Ho and Rip Curl for their partnership. Agreed. I think it was a great pick. I think they were heavily invested in CT surfers between Mick Fanning and Gabriel Medina winning world titles. And so it was a great opportunity for them to pivot to the free surf market and also reinvest in the search, send Mason elsewhere, you know, and Mick retiring, send him along with Mason. And so Mason's, I think it was a Mason's, Mason's willingness to go though. It makes him exceptional. I think I know plenty of wonderful Hawaiian surfers who you couldn't pay him enough to leave the island. Totally. Did we, speaking of Rip Curl, did we ever, I think we both got an email or a direct message, and I don't know if you wrote a story about it or not, but about, um, uh, was it Claw getting let go by the no. new CEO? Neil Ridgway. 
It was Neil. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Did you write about it or do we discuss this? Is this rumor? Is this verified? No, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's verified. It was from a, I guess I can't say verified from a decent source. Made me like, I didn't know the background really. I didn't know if Neil just wanted to retire kind of, and was like, you know, okay, fine. I've, I've done my thing. Or if he was actually cut, right? Like difference between walking away, you know, we're going to thank you for your service, Neil. And it's time for you to go. And Neil thinking also, yeah, it's time for me to go. I've done my thing. But yeah, if Neil Ridgway was cut from Rip Curl, I don't know. Like I'd have to think Neil, Brooke, uh, Ferris, it's Brooke Ferris. Yeah. Yes. The yeah. CEO. Neil and her have a great relationship as far as I was aware. And Rip Curl is kind of like a family more than the other brands. And so I can't imagine it being uh, either dodgy or cutthroat. I don't think I don't think ever of rib curl and cutthroat, right? Well, I don't either. But once you're owned by a private Kathmandu. equity group, yeah, Kathmandu, then everything's <laughs> the business has no feelings. It could be cutthroat because there are no feelings. And the rumor, by the way, was that Neil was cut by Brooke and uh unceremoniously basically yeah neil yeah the the rumor was that neil didn't want to go presumably and they made brooke do it well yeah i mean if it's all true then it makes me sad uh like i've had funny run-ins with neil throughout my surf journalist career uh yeah. and neil is one of the ones who like he was, he was good. Like he was the classic Australian where you could really make fun and give him guff and he would give you guff back. And then I'd make fun some more. And then we'd see each other at a party and he wouldn't shy away. Like he would come up ah, geez. like where we can talk again. Right. Like there, it wasn't jokes and all that aside. I never felt like there was actual personal bad blood between me and Neil. Like I do not that I have bad blood for people, but I feel others bad blood for me, deservedly, right? I'm regularly sending up and making fun and all this stuff. Neil, I always felt, and maybe I'm wrong, but I always felt an underlying Australian enjoyment of what I did. I agree. That company was run, has been run really, really well um, for a very long time. And so, yeah, I think it's an attribute to him and others, but certainly to what you're saying. And so it'd be a shame if things start becoming cutthroat or different, but don't want to hear it. Don't like it. We'll see. We'll see. Um, did you listen to that call that I sent you before we recorded from surf ads? I did, but I didn't get to the end of it. And so, but I could sure. hear it. I could hear it clearly and cleanly. Should I play it again for the listeners? Sure. Okay. Here we go. Surf ads in Australia called into the listener line. What's up, boys? Surf back here. Uh, just wanting to one up old mate last week who was asking about taking relationship advice from a surf podcast. I'm actually after some medical advice from you, too, so let's see how that goes. Uh, it's actually a question I probably already know the answer to, um, but it's also something I think that's a bit of a, a deeper issue, I guess, that a lot of surfers will, will face in their life at some point. So keen to hear what you both think. Um, a couple of years ago, I was out in the, the surf and, and knocked myself out, concussed myself. I uh, actually wrote a story about it at the time on the grid. Uh, it was a small day at home, little rocky reef break. I was out by myself, just mucking around, no one else around. I still don't remember what happened exactly, but um, I actually came to underwater, which was pretty scary. Um, big chunk out of my head. Don't know what happened. Still don't. Uh, got myself out of there, okay. Got home. Was, was fine enough, but definitely for the next couple of weeks had post-concussion syndrome. So I was really tired and lethargic and I actually remember at, at one point um, throwing up after a particularly strenuous setup when I had got back in the water. Uh, but then things settled down for a little while. But now, like two years later, and I, I still notice whenever I get a, uh, a moderate head knock, uh, usually out in the surf, or even if I'm just at home and bang it in the kitchen or something, I really feel it for the rest of the day. Uh, it can be a headache or a little lethargy, uh, that sort of thing. And I, I definitely think it's, it's related to the knock from a couple of years ago. The thing is, I need, 
I know I need to go and get it checked out. I know that if I had told my wife about it, she would make me go and see somebody straight away. But what happens if, if it's something serious and I can't, uh, or if I have to like, wear a helmet for the rest of my life or, or something? And I, I know how ridiculous that sounds, even just saying it out loud. Uh, but there's this big part of me where it happens and the next day I'll be okay and I forget about it for a few months and I just pretend, oh, well, that's all good. Don't need to worry about it anymore. Then it happens again. I know I need to go and get it checked out, and I will uh, at some point. But I bet everybody does similar things in, in their own way, uh, in their own surfing life, whether it's getting a, a sea ulcer from keeping on surfing when you cut your foot open and, and don't let it dry up, or hurting your back or your knee or something like that, continuing to surf on it anyway until it gives instead of getting it treated at the outset. So my question to you, and I, I guess it is a barrel on us, it's uh, about seeking medical advice or treatment when it can potentially interfere with your surfing. Can you hear what you think? And if I do pass out and die tomorrow, uh, thanks for the podcast and keep up the work. Fantastic Thoughts? question. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, and something funny, I had uh, just yesterday, over the last couple of days had like kind of a, I don't know, felt like an irregular heartbeat, like just a fleshy, fluttery feeling. Uh, uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I sort of just a bit stressful days, like, you know, book and whatever life teaching on and on and on. But I think, heck no, do I want to go to the doctor? Like what, what's, what are they going to say? I'm just going to fix it myself. Right. I'll just try to rest a little more and, take it easy and sure enough you know i'm totally right as rain but i it did make me think in general about when you seek medical medical advice you it feels this is bad advice for me but it feels like you open pandora's box Mm -hmm. of a potential other stuff and so just keep on putting duct tape on it and head down moving forward wow so I think that head injuries are different, you know, like what, I, what, are they, what is the doctor going to say? The doctor's well, going to say, yes, you have head injury and you should surf with helmet, which is fine. Like for helmets, I'm all for people surfing with helmets now. Right. Yeah. I think we, we've evolved to understand that the human head is a sensitive thing. Uh, and it's probably a good idea for everybody to surf with the helmet. Right. We've talked about this, whether you do or not is, immaterial it's probably a good idea so if the, the doctor's going to maybe tell you that so great what else well, the doctor gonna tell you? well they're going to be able to monitor situations so i don't know what the treatment is for head trauma necessarily but there is treatment for it and is so there? being yeah definitely um because i remember i did a podcast with derek dunphy who's dealing with a lot of that and then a listener emailed me afterwards he goes dude i've been dealing with a similar issue I've been working with this doctor in San Diego who's done wonders for me and I've seen all these benefits from it. So give Derek my number or whatever and I'll guide him towards the right help. So there is treatment for it. Um, But yeah, being able to monitor it, I think is important because you can be engaging in activity. If you don't think there's a problem, you could be engaging in activities that is making the problem worse, exasperating it and it's just different than a cut, letting the cut fester and then needing to get, needing to deal with that later. Or skin cancer is something that's preventable, you know? So it's like preventative maintenance will prevent you from dying in that scenario. So, or, or if you catch it early, I guess is what I mean. Identifying skin cancer early, you can treat it and not die from it. Letting things go, you can die from. Which I'll totally go against my, in, my instinct perpetually is to duct tape, ignore, uh, like toughen up, man it out, all of that kind of stuff. Right. Which I think that sort of advice is valuable. Like we become too soft, I think, Agreed. inarguably as a culture, as whatever, like, you know, so soft that it's hard for us to deal with any discomfort. Discomfort is a part of life. Where that sort of ethos bumps into, hey, you're being, not only are you being irresponsible, you're being rude to your loved ones by being so dang hard-headed. 
that's a that's a fuzzy line, I suppose, uh, but one that should be examined. So for surf ads, for example, like what is the point of being, you know, manning up, where does that negatively affect loved ones, I suppose? And therein lies the question one should ask. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, my default is the same as yours, which is don't go to the doctor for anything. And it often, it always has fixed itself in the past, but the older I get, the more responsibility I feel to, yeah, I guess it is my loved ones probably. The other response, yeah, the other responsibility here is science is learning a lot about head trauma. And so he can be feeding back into that information loop just by going and being surveyed and being studied his doctor, it's going to be a learning experience for the doctor, you know? So I think it's worth engaging in the conversation for him. Um, and by the way, you don't have to take the doctor's advice entirely. Like maybe he goes to the doctor and the doctor says some stuff that he doesn't agree with. That's okay. But at least get the information being, and then be able to research that information and make a decision for yourself. That is sound advice. I can't believe there was some sound health advice given. Well, what I will really want to do, the reason why I really wanted to play that is because we often get expert feedback from our listeners about these calls. And so we need to open up that call because we do have listeners. I know we have a listener who's a, neuro, a neurology professor at an Ivy League college because he's emailed us in the past. And so there's probably a listener who has expertise in this realm who can call in and then leave a call for us to play next week for surf ads so surf ads do not go to the doctor just <laughs> you've come to the doctor today uh let the doctor deliberate and come back with you with your answer next week don't do anything crazy in this next week where you could injure yourself worse yeah pump the brakes uh, i have a um a fear about head trauma i think because of talking to Derek Dunphy and just a couple of other like maybe documentaries that I've seen where the detrimental effects later in life, you don't, I, you don't know when it happens. You know, when you're 25 and it happens, you Lock don't see head. the immediate effects. You act your what? head and then at 50, you're out on the street murdering people in a or black you, rage. Or, yes. Or you can't remember your grandkids name, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And, the, and science can't necessarily draw conclusion as to how that that, that was the actual cause of the effect, but there's correlations yes. that they're still trying to identify. And this is actually a great time to talk about Tosh Tudor's board slipping out of his hand and hitting young Cruz de Nofa in the head at V-Land and uh, leaving him with need for sutures and stitchers. stitchers. What a story. What a, That was the story of the week, I suppose, in a slow week in surfing. That's the one that was king. It really was. I actually talked to Cruz's dad about it and got the full backstory. Uh, share the, or yeah, share the incident and backstory. So basically, um, Cruz Denofa is a young prodigy surfer from New Jersey. I think he's about 14 years old now. He was 13 when he popped on my radar, and I think that was last year. Um, he was surfing V-Land in Hawaii and got a sick wave he was this super long barrel as he's making his way out of the barrel there's a surfer on the shoulder duck diving whose board pops right out from behind the duck leg kind of thing and uh, flies into the air and Cruz is exiting the barrel and the board hits him right in the back of the kind of side back of the head and Cruz amazingly stays on his feet and makes the barrel but then like kind of shakes his head like whoa what the heck and then the clip shows him sitting in the channel checking and there's blood pouring down his head and a couple of surfers helping him out on the shoulder to assess the situation. Come to find out it was Joel Tudor's son, Tosh Tudor, who was duck diving and the board slipped out. And so there was a little bit of question initially about um, could it be intentional? Because certainly we've all had the board slip out of our hands when we're duck diving. But if you've been surfing for a long time. It probably hasn't happened since your early days of surfing. And it's very rare. And it's even more rare for it to really 
hit somebody. I mean, the timing of it was so suspect that it looked like it could be intentional. But in the comments section, Tosh identified himself, said it was a complete accident. Cruz responded to that and said, I know it was an accident, no hard feelings, you know, this happens. So um, Ta or, uh, Cruz's father, Tim, sent me an additional angle of it just to kind of identify uh, Tosh's line as he's paddling out and whatever. And I asked Tim if he felt like there was anything behind the incident. And Tim said, I'm still gathering most of my info from the videos. What you see is pretty much the story. It tells itself. It's definitely intense to watch, but you can see how the collision happened. It's unfortunate because I can see a few ways that this could have been avoided. Um, Tosh messaged Cruz that night to apologize and said that the board did in fact just slip through his hands in the duck dive. I feel like it would have been the right move for Tosh to have checked on Cruz immediately and help him get to the beach rather than paddle away and continue to surf. But there's a possibility that Tosh didn't know that that had happened. Uh, we are very thankful for Corey Lope. Pe Corey Lopez and Cruz's buddy Max, because they were right there after the collision to check on his head. The cut was so deep that you could clearly see his skull exposed. Together, those two paddled Cruz to the beach, took him straight to the hospital. Cruz ended up receiving four sutures and 10 staples to the head. Oh, uh, how old is Tosh again? I think 16. Okay, so same age-ish as kid i mean both I seen, minors i haven't seen the other angle I, there's no way i can imagine like nobody shoots there i mean the, that dude just shot his board whatever joel commented on that one about the stop whining about it on social media did we talk about that last week the dude who shot his board we talked about it a couple of weeks ago magno pacheco shooting his board at levi slauson at the dominican yeah. republic qs event yes and so that was a clear, he was definitely shooting his board, right? That was totally unacceptable behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everybody knows that's dangerous, even more dangerous, like flying your board up when somebody's exiting the tube. I can't imagine that Tosh would have done it on purpose. Uh, somebody wrote in the Beach Freak comments about the volume of the board, which that almost made the most sense to me is maybe the board was just a little too big for him. Uh, yeah. He tried to duck dive and just the buoyancy because i've tried to duck dive like yeah my my mid length right and i haven't shot it out but you can kind of feel it sometimes obviously it's more difficult to get deep um but yeah it really was a scary incident and i'll agree with tim that the polite thing to do is of course you better paddle back and check like any surfer who's listening to this if you fly your board out even if you don't know that it hit somebody if you do something like that on the wave, chances are that you might have. And so at least go check. And certainly he saw Cruz driving through that tube, you know, so, um, and I think that was really, it was a combination of the board's volume because that board was bulky. Yeah. Uh, it'd be very tough to duck dive. So it was a combination of the board's volume and him seeing Cruz coming down in the tube and probably scrambling. And you know, when you're scrambling like that, you don't do a full hearted duck dive. It's kind of like, ah, do I paddle two more times or do I duck dive early? Like, and so it probably just slipped in that melee and maybe there was a set on the horizon. So once he got his board back to him, he realized I need to book it out, you know? And so he just booked out to get past maybe the next surfer on the next wave. And by that time he looked back and Cruz was already into the beach. And so he thought nothing I could do about it now. I'll message him tonight. Maybe that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, totally. And I mean, grace, obviously, given, you know, there's, I think, accidents happen and, uh, you know, you do what you do, like stab, magazine, given grace, given the happens to the best of us. Uh, but the, yeah, oof, it's not, it's not very cool. It's a bummer. I mean, it's, it's a huge bummer for Cruz because obviously, be like we said, he'll be what? He'll be, I mean, he'll be out of the water. Presumably he was in Hawaii for a minute and I can't imagine that you're surfing quickly with staples in your head. Maybe he is. I'm more concerned about just the head trauma conversation, you know, like those staples will heal, but as the father, I'd be worried about the long-term effects. And so keeping 
tabs on all of that eye pupil dilation sleep patterns all that sort of stuff mm. no joke man I'm telling you no um well, let's do a commercial for let's go to commercial talk about ag1 and then we'll be back with barrel or not right i've got it right here i'm using the old shaker because that's all i could find but look at this nutrition dark I, dark green i except I had my own 6.30 in the morning. All Good for you. Tasty, dripping some vitamin D's in there. Shaking Good it up. Yeah. See, I'm feeling, I'm feeling lethargic right now because I waited until 10 o'clock so that you and I could actually witness or the listeners could witness me shaking and drinking. You do it for the viewer. You sacrifice optimum morning health for the viewer. And I applaud you for it. I thank you for selfishly became my best self first thing good well the listeners benefit from that as well uh in your uh sharp wit and thinking for the podcast but athleticgreens.com slash surf is what we are talking about it is real simple it's the best product of its type on the market so if you're going to be you might have 20 supplements that you take throughout the day a bunch of pills on the counter that are expensive they're hard on your stomach uh this is the best product of its kind. You can research that on their website and see what's in it and how it's sourced, but it's whole food sourced. It's basically organic. a whole yeah, organic made in New Zealand. It's essentially superfood, whole foods made into a super drink. And it's a one scoop you mix with eight ounces of water. You get the whole thing done in 20 second ritual. You don't even have to shop for the thing. All you do is go to athleticgreens.com slash surf. Once you set up the subscription, even that you can do in like two minutes. It then arrives at your door every month. You don't have to feel anxiety about your daily diet, stress about your daily diet, what decisions you're going to make. None of that. You just do this for 20 seconds a day and you're covered. Let's be honest too. How many of your healthy habits do you actually look forward to? Almost all of them feel like a chore, right? Like they feel like, okay, I've got to do this. Athleticgreens.com slash surf. I can't wait to wake up. To pa I look as much forward to athleticgreens.com slash surf as I do my coffee. Me too. Me too. I and my cocktail in the evening. Who would have ever thunk? And the, the listener feedback is the other key here. It has been nothing but glowing. I've had lots of feedback and not one of them has been negative people go out of their way to be like hey thanks that was a great recommendation i've even defied listeners to say something negative about it try it out and say this made me feel bad it's impossible it is and it keeps us in business too Chaz. so win 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 for you win for athletic greens win for the listener and you can support and reach optimal health at athleticgreens.com slash surf. Thank you. And thank yourself. Back to the show, Chaz. We're going to close out with Barrel or Nah. Exciting. Barrel or Nah, referring to yourself as a foodie. So Nah. So Nah. Referring to yourself as a foodie uh, is a nah for multiple reasons it's one of those things that should just be you can consider yourself a foodie in your own mind that's totally okay you can think i have a developed palate i have an adventurous epicurean appetite etc 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 all fine and good those thoughts of yourself should never come out of your mouth i you should. completely agree you this is the oh what? Yeah. I mean, you can show people that you yeah. have a taste and stuff by going to inter interesting restaurants, making interesting food. Show, don't say. It is the instant identifier that you, in fact, are not a foodie. Um, with anything in life, there's somebody, you think you're wealthy, there's somebody more wealthy than you. You think you know a lot about whatever it is, there's somebody that knows more than you. You know who is the person who doesn't know a ton is the person who thinks that they know a ton. And so just by identifying, I'm an artist. 
You're not an artist. You're, pro yeah, you're probably not an artist, yeah. you know, because if you really were, you would know how little you actually know. That's part of the process of being an artist. And so, yeah, self-identifying as a foodie is an instantaneous scarlet letter, a big F across your chest. That is exactly why I identify as a surf journal. So everyone will know I am in fact not. And not expect you to actually do any reporting. Exactly. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad because I want people to stop using that phrase when referring to themselves. So this was our PSA. Let's see. Um, barrel or not, smashing your surfboard after a heat. Um, I'm going to go barrel. I'm going to go if as long as the WSL keeps serving up boring courses, at least there's some spice there, right? There's something to look at. There's something to maybe chuckle at. There's some, yeah, it, it's entertainment. Watching somebody smash a board is nothing if not entertaining. I always love it. Every time I see it, I always love it. I always rewatch it multiple times. The one of Kelly Slater that just resurfaced Beautiful. in Portugal a few years ago, where he jumps with both feet, lands on it, the thing slips out and he hits the ground. Hilarious. It's perfect, yeah. I mean, I would go for, I don't want artificial board smashing, uh, but any professionals out there listening, feel free, have at your board. It's entertaining the rest of us. I think, um, what's his name? This Channel Islands team rider. Oh, Joao Chianca did it in Portugal. Like he lost his heat, came out of Hawaii with all this acclaim. We're waiting to see what he could do in Portugal. He lost early rounds in Portugal and started beating the crap out of his board. Sad for Rick Merrick, happy for me. And happy, like makes me still like Joao Chianca, you know? like. Yep. The best one ever is the image that you continuously run on Beach Grid of Jordy Smith with a full punch, but missing the board. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, there's no wrong time. There's no, I've never seen, now that we talk about it more, there's, I've never seen a board beating that I didn't love. Mm -hmm. I want to see more. Um, the, Dane somebody Reynolds? sent, I don't remember Dane's. I think Dane started whacking his board in the lineup once. He was just sitting yeah. there on it. I believe it. Um, a listener sent me a clip from Supercross. Is that called the AMA? What's that organization called? I can't remember. American Motorcycle Association? I don't know who was the actual governing body of Supercross. Whoever it is, the equivalent of the WSL, but in the motocross world, um, sent me a clip from their Instagram feed to, fight, or to uh, riders coming to blows. Like in the middle of a race, and I think they were on the same team because they were wearing the same outfits. Um, they crashed into one another or whatever, and they got up and started pushing and shoving and then like throwing punches at one another. And he sent it to me and said, the WSL would never publish this on their Instagram feed if it was two uh, surfers. And I thought, man, you're entirely right. And what a missed opportunity because now I'm suddenly interested in Supercross. Yeah. You know? Sorry, surfing, you just lost even more cachet. I'm gonna have, I have my five minutes a day of watching something is now going to Supercross. Mm -hmm. Completely. Um, okay, final barrel or not? April Fool's jokes. Mm. I think I go back and forth each year when this is a barrel or not. Barrel or not, I mean. Uh, I think last year I was a not. I think this year I'm gonna go barrel along the same line of looking for entertainment, wanting more entertainment, give me a good entertaining one. If I get caught in it, that's the thing. Okay, here's the truth. It is a barrel if you actually catch me and fool me. It is a nah if I see through it right away. What about you doing one to somebody else though? Uh, it would be the same. If I actually fool them, then it was barrel. If I... Okay if i say something or do something and they say oh i get it april fools then i'd say then i brought shame upon myself and my family agreed i don't really want somebody like jumping out from around the corner at me or something stupid but if there's like an elaborate joke that is set up where i literally think like i lost my job or my car got stolen or something like that and i have to live with that for 20 minutes i i gotta respect that joke that's a good joke do you remember the film, Michael Douglas film, Sean Penn, I do believe is in it, the game? 
Yes, uh, I just watched it recently. And that is a great example of an April Fools-esque whole thing being set up, well executed, well done, bravo, right? And so if something actually fools somebody, then it's a barrel. If it's not, and that's what dumb corporations have taken to by doing their, uh, you know, whatever, their April Fool's things that are you see through right away as a marketing stunt, boring and silly. We'll Stop. see what we'll see what surf outlets or surfers do in one week from today. I will be waiting with bated breath. We should uh, grade them on next show. We should we should give everybody their April Fool's surf media April Fool's Day rankings. I agree. Well, the next show I think is on April first, so we might not might have to do it the following show. That's okay. This is a great idea that can simmer. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, hey, um, that was an excellent show. And uh, what else you got? Is that it? I'm headed straight back in to teach mathematics. Okay, maths. Yep, the maths. Well, um, I normally let you sign us off with a get barrel, but you know who should sign us off today, Chaz? I think this should be the new sign off forevermore. I really think it should too. Uh, so I will say goodbye to you, Chaz. So long. And until next week. Bon voyage. All right. See ya. <laughs>